My subject is spiritual warfare. And there are several things that we need to understand. So let's just have a word of prayer and then we'll start. Okay. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you're doing. Lord, even in spite of COVID, we can still connect. We can still uh, listen to your word. We can still be encouraged and challenged. And so for uh, the next 40 minutes or so, Lord, would you come and anoint everything that I'm about to share. And may it be, Lord, very useful and very powerful uh, contribution to those who are listening and watching in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, can you see the PowerPoint? You can, okay. So what we've got to do is, I'll go back one. Uh, we need to know who God is. That's where it all starts. And I put a few things there. God is omnipotent. You know all this. You're studying theology. Uh, he's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's holy. He's a God of love. He's the creator. He's worthy of our worship. And he's worthy of our service. And a whole lot of uh, extra things as well. But uh, these are the significant ones. All right, so we need to know who Jesus, who God is. Then we need to know who Jesus is. Well, there's a few things about Jesus. Who is he? He's the son of God. He's king. He's priest. He's savior. He's mediator. And he's bondage breaker. And that's only... Uh, a, a sort of an introduction really but we need to know who Jesus is and then we need to know who the Holy Spirit is and again this is just uh, a handful of possibilities he's the comforter he's the convictor he's the counselor he's the sanctifier he's the teacher He's the guide into all truth, but he guides us into the will of God as well. And he's the empowerer. So he provides the ability and the enabling and the anointing for all of us to be in ministry and to be effective in ministry. We need to know who the enemy is. And uh, these are just a few things. The next slide will show him in far more detail. But here he is. The enemy is the tempter, the oppressor, the deceiver, the enslaver, the bondage maker. So when we looked at who Jesus is, he's the bondage breaker. But the one who makes the bondage is the bondage maker is Satan or the devil. Now, these are some aspects. We need to understand where the devil has come from. And it's a difficult subject to find an accurate answer. The Bible generally is fairly silent about where the enemy came from but we understand from verses like Isaiah 14 verses 12 to 15 now Isaiah and the book of Ezekiel have passages like this and in other parts of the scripture there are similar passages that have immediate historical uh, reference points but the content is so wide that it could 
be interpreted as beyond the immediate into either a prophetic look at the past or a prophetic look into the future. And throughout the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, there are passages of scripture that have an immediate historical impact, but they also have the, the reference point of Jesus uh, in, in a prophetic sense. So these verses in Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 15, could be applied to the devil. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid, I must have missed something here. Uh, but this is a picture of somebody who deliberately set themselves up to be more important than they were created to be. Now, in these contexts, if you're taking notes, uh, you need to come back and research passages like this yourself. We don't have time to do that today. But here's another verse or another few verses. And these verses relate to historically the king of Tyre. But within that framework, there is the possibility of a prophetic reference point back into almost pre-creation times. So I've just taken a list of things. And this list uh, is far bigger than any human king could ever possibly be. And so these are some of the things said about the king of Tyre. You were the seal of perfection. You were full of wisdom. You were perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. You were in the Garden of Eden. Okay, so... The king of Tyre couldn't have been in that situation. Then there's a whole list of precious stones, and it says every precious stone adorned you. And then we get a signal here. You were created. So if this is a reference to the devil, then we understand very clearly that he's a created being. Then he was also anointed. In that passage of scripture, he's called the guardian or a guardian cherub. Uh, the king of Tyre couldn't possibly be one of those. Uh, in the early stages, he's considered to be blameless. But at some point uh, in those very early beginnings, wickedness was found in him. And because of that wickedness, he was driven out, expelled in disgrace. And then the reasons for some of that were your heart became proud and you were thrown down to the earth. So uh, again, because you're theological students, you need to take a passage like this and research and make your own decisions. All right. So, but for me, verses like this have great significance. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Now, these are some names of Satan. And again, uh, I won't go into any great depth on them, but these are some of his names. Uh, and I think if I've got it right, Jeff can probably uh, give, either give you this PowerPoint or have these sort of notes printed off for you. So there we go. Now. Uh, There's a few more additions to who he is. And you can see from this two slide full of names that there's nothing there that's really a demonstration of anything that we would want to know about. Uh, all these names are really quite negative. 
And then in that same context, where you have a truth and the enemy is at work, you will find a counterfeit. And so these are some aspects of the counterfeit approaches that the devil uses. Uh, there is a trinity within the Godhead. There's a satanic trinity. And then there are all these other things. So the enemy has all these things that he can call on. Uh, he has his own synagogue, and you find that in the book of Revelation. Uh, he has his own ministers. He's got his own theology. He's got a sacrificial system. Uh, he can have a level of communion. He has a, a demonic kind of gospel. He has his own throne. He has his worshippers. He has false Christs, false teachers, false prophets, false brethren, false apostles. So these are the elements that we need to know and understand when we're thinking about spiritual warfare. And then we need to know who we are. Uh, and these are, again, just uh, a handful of possibilities and realities. We are a child of God. We are equipped to be fruitful and effective. We are empowered. We are, or should be, bold and confident. Now, if you want to take a passage of Scripture, 1 John chapter 3, these are some key words. Uh, how great is the Father's love that he has lavished upon us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. That's who we are. And we need to know that. We need to be very clear about our relationship to God through, the, through Jesus. And so 1 John has many, many things to say that are relevant to us. So, and I'm just going through this very quickly. But in verse 16, love is expressed. How is expressed? Jesus laid down his life for us, and we should be prepared to lay down our lives for our brothers. Love demonstrated. And again, if we have material possessions and we see a brother in need and don't have pity, then how can we say that we are God's children? Then the benefits of our faith in Jesus. Faith is a relationship, but it's a relationship that must work itself out in action. And so in verses 19-20, we can set our own hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. Why? Because God is greater than our condemning hearts and he knows everything. So... Continuing benefits uh, for us, because we're his children, there should not be any condemnation. We have confidence before God. We obey him. We do what pleases him. We ask and we receive. And in spiritual warfare, those are things that we need to constantly be aware of and constantly practice. God's expectation of us, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus, that we love one another, that we obey his commands, we live in him, he lives in us, and we have and regularly experience the witness of the Holy Spirit. And then the power of prayer in spiritual warfare, the power of prayer is something that we need to tap into know the power of prayer know your authority 
in Christ. And there's two words there, power, and you'll know this from your theology. Power is what belonged to Jesus. Because he was who he was, he had that power. But he also had the right to give that authority to his children. And we need to experience that. We need to believe that. And we need that authority. Okay. Now, spiritual warfare. The spiritual warfare is not flesh and blood. We're not doing battle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So we need to appreciate this Old Testament passage, and I'll go through it very, very quickly. This is Daniel, and he had some questions that he was desperate to have answers for. And so he determined that he would take three weeks to wait on God for these answers. Now, you'll all know how many days in three weeks? We all know that, 21. Okay, and so in this passage on the 24th day of the first month, I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. Now, why was he the only one? Because he took the time and made the effort to put aside 21 days to wait on God. Now, what happened? Uh, He's there waiting on the Lord and then an angel or some heavenly being appeared and he says, I was left alone. I had no strength. My face was down to the ground, deadly pale, and he was helpless. And you look in the Old Testament, you find in Isaiah 6 that men like Isaiah had that same kind of experience. Why? Because they're in the presence of the holiness of God. So what happens? Verse 9, this person speaks to him and he falls into some kind of a trance. And then God begins to illuminate uh, so many things. Yeah, I'm sorry, I've got to try and find where I'm where I'm up to. There we are. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands. And then this man, this person speaks to him. Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider very carefully the words that I'm about to speak to you. Stand up because I have now been sent to you. So the thing that... Daniel was desperate to know was about to be revealed, but only because he determined to pray into the whole affair. And so the message from this angelic being is this. Do not be afraid, Daniel. From the first day that you set your mind to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard now remember he's been praying for 21 days but his prayer was already being answered from day one but there was a delay there was a delay and the delay was because over uh, in this context the prince of persia or the kingdom of Persia resisted me 21 days. And then another powerful angel had to come and help because of this delay in the spiritual dimension. And I believe uh, that in today's world, governments don't operate from human wisdom. There are 
spiritual forces at work. And I, I, I believe, along with so many others, that in the spiritual realm, there are demonic forces operating over nations and kingdoms. And we, like Daniel, have to take time to pray into the spiritual realm and believe that God can work against those forces in response to our prayers. So here is Daniel praying. And after 21 days, the message got through to him. There was a delay because of the battle in the spiritual realm. The answer was already on its way on day one. And I, again, I believe that for the 21 days, Daniel continued to pray and in a special sense was actually an instrument in God's hand in this spiritual battle. And after 21 days, uh, this archangel or the spiritual being finally broke through and came and gave Daniel the message. So we need to understand that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but we are fighting against principalities and powers. Now, this is a passage of scripture that I've preached on for many, many years. And I call I just take you through it. And again, you need to reach for your own scripture, go through this passage and see what God will say to you. But it's a very powerful message. I'm grateful to the NIV because in the NIV, it uses many words that have this R-E, I put it in red. Those words all begin with that combination. But there was a report, there was a reaction, there was a resolve or a resolution. Then there was a response. And so from every village, from every household, people came to seek the Lord for help. Then there was a prayer. And in that prayer, the relationship of the nation of Israel to God was established and made clear. And then there was a reminder that God has done things for them in the past. And for us, we need to remember that what God has done in the past, he can do again and again and again. And then there was a remembrance. Then there was a repayment. So in the prayer, uh, Jehoshaphat talks about how their enemies repaid them for previous kindnesses. The realization and this is something very significant in the realm of spiritual warfare. We have no power. We don't have power. We don't know what to do. And in many, many situations, we don't know what to do. But we have to learn not to look at ourselves, but to lift our eyes much higher and realize what. God can do. Yeah. So there's a response. And what it says there, our eyes are on you. Our eyes have to be focused and fixed on Jesus. And then all the people, and there were more than a million of them, all stood. And in the middle of all that crowd, one man stood up basically and made a prophetic speech. And what he said was, 
that they were not to be afraid because the battle was not going to be theirs. And in spiritual warfare, we need to re realize and recognize that the battle is not ours. God is the one who fights. God is the one who wins the victories. So they all stood, this gentleman, Jezahil, prophesied, and then they all fall down and they worship. And the result of all of that is there was victory. And in the course of getting that victory, they couldn't claim that they won the battle. They won the battle because God went ahead of them and there was a reward. And we read in the scripture there that it took them three days to gather up all the spoils of war. Now, there are at least 1,100,000 and something thousands fighting men. Now, you imagine that number of men going around the battlefield, collecting all the leftovers, and it took them three days. And because of that, at the end of it all, they rejoiced. And for the nations around them, there came this result. They feared God. They feared God. And they recognized that the God of Israel was stronger than anything that they could call on. And then in that last verse, there was rest. And so where there was war and turmoil, God brought into the midst of his people peace and rest because they had won through him that great victory so there's a lot of excitement in in the old testament yeah spiritual warfare again i'm just giving you a very speedy sort of overview but in revelation chapter 12 and for me, this is probably one of the most significant passages of scripture that I have come across in my ministry. There was war in heaven. And Michael, now we read about Michael in Daniel chapter 10. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. Now, the most, one of the most significant verses that I, I believe in the whole of scripture in relation to spiritual warfare is this. Michael and his angels fight against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fight back. But he was not strong enough. Now, we would be mad to say that he's not strong. He is strong, but never strong enough for Jesus. He was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. Now, think back to what I said earlier about the origin of Satan. Now, see what happens in this context. There was this battle. Michael fought against the dragon. He fought back. He was not strong enough. And because he wasn't strong enough, what happened? The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world, he was hurled down to the earth and his angels with him. Now, I would have to believe that that connects with the passages in Isaiah and Ezekiel. This dragon was hurled down to the earth. And somewhere before even the Garden of Eden, this event happened. Okay. Then again, 
for you and I in spiritual warfare, a, a verse like this is a very powerful instrument when we're dealing in spiritual warfare. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accused them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Now, again, those passages in Isaiah and Ezekiel, they talk about how this king of Tyre or this perhaps satanic being was hurled down because he tried to take over God's place. He tried to make himself number one. And because of his pride and all the other things, he was hurled down. And we need to remember that. And in this whole spiritual warfare uh, approach to ministry, these passages from Revelation are just so powerful. And so what does he say? Verse 11, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb. So we need to be mindful that victory is because Jesus shed his blood on the cross. We need to know that we have a testimony. We are the children of God. That's what we're called. That's what we are. And we need to prove that and we need to demonstrate that in the spiritual realm. We're not just waffling around as human beings. We have divine authority. Jesus said he's given to us the authority that he has. And we need to exercise it. And so that's our testimony. And this whole thing, not loving li our lives so much as to shrink from death. We are the victors. We don't need to be afraid. And then in verse 12, therefore rejoice, you who dwell in them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I can't quite see the text there because of the pictures, but you'll see it. So verse 12. And the whole context there that the devil has gone down to them. Whoop. Uh, And that verse 12 is a very significant verse again. And right at the end there, this enemy is filled with fury. Why? Because he knows that his time is short. Now, he's working overtime to try and convince the world around us that he's here forever. We as God's children know that he is not supreme, that his time is limited. And we need on a regular basis to confront the enemy, Satan, and keep reminding him that his time is limited. His time is short. And in my ministry, I've experienced, uh, for want of a better word, a level of deliverance ministry. And I've had demonic spirits scream out to me and tell me that that one reference point is something they really hate. Their time is short and they know it. And we need to emphasize that as well. So spiritual warfare is a huge subject and I'm only glossing over it. But uh, we need to be reminded 
that the victory has been won already. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from a place of victory. And we need to recognize and we need to uh, be more aware of what God is doing. Uh, these verses and reference points from Nehemiah, I won't go through them today, but the whole book of Nehemiah is a book on spiritual warfare and all these different things. Spiritual warfare is uh, rampant in the, in the book of Nehemiah, but we don't have time for that today. Then Ephesians chapter 6, and you know all this. Uh, you'll probably studied Ephesians at some point. Uh, if not, I'm sure it's going to, it will happen. But Ephesians chapter 6, our armor. And so Paul says, finally, be strong. And that's his word to us. Be strong. In what? In the Lord. And what else? In his mighty power. Put on. Now that's my responsibility. That's your responsibility. It's not going to be automatic. The full armor. That means put everything on. Put everything on. Whose armor is it? It's God's. What does it do? It enables us to stand against the devil's schemes. And then here it is again. Our struggle, like it was for Daniel, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it is against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. That's where the action is. And because of this spiritual dimension, Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, stand your ground. And after you've done everything that God's asking and requiring, still stand. Put on the full armor of God. Stand firm, the belt of truth around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, that all these pieces of equipment, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, and I'll talk about faith in the next session, but this faith, the shield of faith, what does it do? It extinguishes all, not just some, all the flaming arrows of the wicked one. The helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And I would encourage all of you, while you're studying theology, become very aware, become very familiar with the truths and the principles of God's word, because the devil hates god's word he hates it and that's going to be our biggest weapon and then a lot of people when they talk about the armor of god uh, they miss verse 18 but verse 18 actually gathers all the loose pieces together and the word there is that prayer is a major force in spiritual warfare pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints but prayer is critical prayer is a huge dynamic force in spiritual warfare we need to appreciate that and we need to recognize it and lay hold of it as daniel prayed for 21 days 
I, I think about Daniel's 21 days of prayer and I think, I wonder what would have happened if halfway through the 21 days, he got up and he thought, well, nothing's happening. God's not doing anything. So I might as well just go home. But he didn't. He hung in there and he kept going. And because he was persistent and he didn't give up, then what he was looking for, God delivered to him. He wanted to know about the future of Israel and God gave him the answer, but he had to pursue it. He had to persevere in prayer. And that's something that we have to pursue. And I have, I have a wonderful story about the power of prayer, uh, but I don't, again, I don't have time to just share that with you, but uh, it's, it's a reminder to me that God answers prayer and we need to be very conversant. We need to be very aware of the power of prayer and how God responds and how God answers prayer. So there it is. I think uh, I might hold it there if that's all right. And uh, we'll come back later, I think, and you can ask me some questions. But uh, it's a very speedy flyover approach today. Uh, I haven't covered everything that I have notes for, but uh, those biblical passages, especially, if you can get a handle on those and make them your own, you will be. Uh, a worry to the devil and all his demonic forces. He hates people who are familiar with the right passages of scripture. So uh, hopefully I've encouraged you. Hopefully I've challenged you uh, in the whole realm of spiritual warfare. It's a huge subject, but God bless you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Maurice. Um... It's now um, seven to three uh, because we spend uh, like, like 10 minutes uh, for waiting okay. for people to come in. So uh, we're going to have seven minutes break. Then we come back um, and we'll be starting um, like three o'clock sharp, right? For the next session. Okay. So, Wonderful. Yep. Enjoy break for six minutes. Thank you. All right. So second session, um, the mission of spirituality. Uh, also, Morris will be speaking on that issue. Okay. All right. Let me just start again with a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll see what happens. Lord Jesus, thank you for being you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we know you through your word and through the ministry of your holy spirit lord we know the father through the word and through you and lord uh, we just come today and lord this whole issue of spirituality lord it's a huge subject and lord we don't want to get left behind but lord we do want to be on the cutting edge of living our lives for you so thank you as we open your word and as we share together, Lord, come, Holy Spirit, and open our eyes, open our minds, open our understanding, open the scriptures, and glorify yourself in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, spirituality, ultimately, begins with what we in our mission call union with Christ. Union with Christ. Now, it's not a new concept. Uh, Hudson Taylor, uh, who is one of the famous uh, pioneer missionaries, he wrote a little book on union with Christ. And uh, in what 
is loosely called a revival that happened in Rwanda and then crossed over into the Congo. Uh, one of the major themes of that revival was called Union with Christ. And I want to try and illustrate that for you. Now, illustrations are not the total answer. Illustrations help, but they don't. When we're talking spiritual things, illustrations usually fall a little bit short. But what I want to do, this whole thing of union with Christ, I think I can illustrate it for you quite well. So here, if you can see these things, uh, it looks like it looks like one block. But they're actually, I'll have to, there's one, there's two, there's three, and there's four. Hopefully you can see them all. How many can you see? Can you see four? Okay. All right. So three of them are what color? Red. Red. Okay. All right. And one of them is? Green. Green. All right. Are they all the same size? No. No. Okay. Now, as I said, illustrations are limited. But what I try to communicate is that this big one represents God the Father. This one in the middle wherever he is, represents Jesus. This little green one, whoop, I don't have enough fingers, but anyway, this little green one is you or me, a human being. Okay, so we're a little bit different. These three are all the same color. They're all made of plastic. Even this one, the little green one is made of plastic. Now, as an illustration, I could say that these three are all the same essence. They're all the same in makeup. But the size of them suggests that they have a different responsibility. They have a different role. And so here am I over here wandering around unconnected to Jesus. This is me, just pre-conversion. Now, I want you to read, if you've got a Bible there, read this verse. I'm reading from John chapter 14. And I'm picking up the thread at verse 20. Now, Jesus is talking to his disciples and preparing them for an event that is still to come. So what does he say? On that day, now that's the day when the Holy Spirit touches their lives in a very unique and very special way. But what he's saying is, on that day, you will realize, you will know, you'll understand that you are in me. No, hang on. You will realize I'm in my Father. You are in me. I am in you. Now, if you watch very carefully, this is God the Father. Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, you'll know and you'll understand that I am in my Father. And because of your relationship with me, you come in from outside and you accept me, you believe in me, and you are in me. 
And then he says, and I will be, and here's the Holy Spirit. And what happens? I will be in you through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so this is, to me, is a wonderful demonstration of union with Christ. And if you can understand and if you can, if you can grasp that picture, because spirituality begins with knowing and experiencing and operating on the basis of this illustration. Jesus is in the Father. You and I are in Jesus. And through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he is in us. Now, spiritually, I think this is as near an illustration as I could ever find. And it proves to me that our security and our safety is very, very powerfully connected to an illustration like this. When opposition comes, it has to get past God the Father. If he opens his fingers, it still has to get past the Holy Spirit. And then for us in ministry, we operate and we are equipped because of the anointing and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives to make us effective ministers of the gospel. And so in that illustration, we have our security, we have our anointing, we have our intimacy with God, all tied up in that one illustration. On that day, you will know, you will understand on the day that the Holy Spirit comes into your life and into your ministry, you will know that you are in union with God. You're in union with Jesus. You're in harmony with the Holy Spirit. And over the years, I, I bought these plastic things. Uh, they cost me about, I forget, either $2 or $5. But over the years, I've had hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of good value because I've used them in so many conferences and so many churches and people have come later and they have thanked me for demonstrating our relationship with Jesus. And so spirituality begins with our relationship with Jesus. Okay, now I have notes here. Uh, in terms of things that we should know and understand. If you're taking notes, I try and go slow, but uh, these are some of the things that are required. These are some of the things that God expects from you and I. Some of the things in terms of spirituality are words like this. Submit to God. Submit to God. And in that same context, in James chapter 4, verse 7, submit to God. Then the other word is resist. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, in our Western society, those are two words that a lot of westernized European thinking people don't like. Submission is not a word that a lot of people enjoy. Resisting the devil or resisting is not a, a word that we, we enjoy. And yet this is what God expects. Submission. Submission to God, resisting the devil, 
And then in that same context, come near to God, come near. And what happens? The promise is that he, oh, there's my notes there, good. He will come near to you. That's a promise. And then it says, wash your hands. Now, we've got COVID in New Zealand. You've got it in Korea. And our government has just given us a, a lockdown again. We're at level four. We've had more than 100 days of almost normal. And then last night, they closed the door. And uh, we're at level four, which is the highest level. So we'll be in level four for a week, but it'll probably go longer than that. But the, the government on the news is reminding everybody that our responsibility as a nation and as a community is to wash our hands. Why? Because this COVID thing can spread. So wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. Now that's something that we do. Washing our hands is our responsibility. Purifying our hearts is our responsibility. It's not automatic. We have to be active. We have to set our minds to get on and do it. Uh, mourn and wail, which means genuinely repent. Genuinely repent. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Uh, again, a lot of people don't like words like humility and humbleness. Uh, we're proud. We're arrogant. And so humble yourselves before the Lord. It's not in front of people. It's before the Lord. And what does he say he'll do? He will lift you up. He'll lift you up. Now, in the book of Colossians, from verses 3 to 15, there's a whole string of possibilities. When you were dead in your sin and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. Alive, but only in Christ. Only in Christ. What did he do? He forgave all our sins. He's taken our sin away. He's nailed it to the cross. He's disarmed powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them. Wow. In the Old Testament especially, when an army conquered another army, they took people back to Rome or wherever, and they were in chains, and they paraded them around in front of the people as a sign and as an evidence of a wonderful victory. And this is so pictorial of what Jesus has done for us. He's disarmed, disarmed powers and authorities. Why? Because he got the victory. He got the victory. Uh, he triumphed over these things. How? Through the cross. And then in Philippians 3.10, he says, Paul says, I want to know Christ. And this whole thing about spirituality is knowing Christ, knowing him, not knowing about him, but knowing him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. Spirituality must demonstrate a level of spiritual authority and spiritual power. So there's a, there's a mountain of possibility. Romans 5.5, 5, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, now it's not who is going to, he has, he's done it already. He's done it blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing, every spiritual blessing. We're not scratching around. We've got everything that we need. It's a matter of 
exercising faith, appropriating everything that God has given to us and believing that he's given us the authority, he's given us the power, and we can, by faith, exercise all of those possibilities. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 to 20, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's spirituality. Where does it come from? God gives us the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. To what end? So that you may know him better. I have a question for you. You're studying theology. My question is this. Today, do you know Jesus better today than you did a year ago? You should do. You should be growing. You should be more aware. You should be more familiar in the, in the right sense of that with the word and, and with him, more connected. And so all these things are connected to spirituality. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. There should be enlightenment in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Great power. That's spirituality. People need to see more of that great power. And that power is the same kind of power as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. The power that can raise somebody from the dead, that's, that's a lot of power. And it's part of our inheritance. The level and the, the, the degree of power that is available and then in Romans chapter 12, and I went through the whole of chapter 12, and there's a lot of spirituality stuff there. Uh, and you can see it all there on the notes. Uh, just quickly, the word therefore refers several chapters back in the book of Romans. So in Romans 12, the therefore is going back to chapter 6. And because of all that is revealed in chapter six, then there's some kind of illustrations and some reinforcing. Now in chapter 12, he's gathering it all together and saying, because of all this stuff, this is what you should be doing. So Paul urges his readers to a particular action. Urge is a very powerful word. It's not sort of ho-hum stuff. It's quality. It's purposeful. And so here it is. He urges them uh, to do something. The presenting of our bodies to God. Now, it's not just presenting an arm. It's presenting our whole body. Everything that is me, I have the responsibility of offering to God. And he's offering as a living sacrifice. Now, in the, in the scriptures, the sacrifices, when they finally ended up on the altar, they were dead. They were dead. But what God is asking from you and me is that our lives as living people are offered to God in ministry, in devotion, in prayer. You name it, that's the level of sacrifice that he wants but it's got to be living and so it goes on and this sacrifice he says this is an act of consecration now in the old testament you'll know all this uh, the priesthood were consecrated they were set apart they were considered to be holy men of god and we have the opportunity and the responsibility on a regular basis 
to present ourselves as holy men and women committed and devoted to God. And those offerings can be holy. That's a great word, holy, and acceptable, acceptable. For thus, the reality of offering ourselves is our reasonable service. Why is it reasonable? It's reasonable because Jesus paid a horrible, awful, in-depth price to bring us to himself. Anybody who would willingly die for somebody else, that's a major sacrifice. And the expectation throughout scripture is because of the magnitude of God's love demonstrated through Jesus. It's a reasonable suggestion that we give ourselves totally to him. That's spirituality. And so it goes on. And I, I don't have time, but you've got all the notes there. So uh, just go through those and you'll find the same thing in the book of Colossians, a whole string of responsibilities and a whole string of expectations in relation to spirituality. Be filled with the knowledge of his will. Let me ask you, do you know God's will for your life today? Do you have some sense already? Uh, you may not graduate for a year or two, but God may already be speaking to you about your future ministry. Uh, we need to know what his will is. We need to have spiritual wisdom. We need to have spiritual understanding. Our walk needs to be in a manner worthy of the Lord. We need to be bearing fruit. We need to be increasing in the knowledge of God. And there's a whole string of responsibilities that are a whole string of expectations when we talk about spirituality and uh, it just goes on and goes on but uh, I want to make it a little bit more practical and so in our mission now Jeff I'm sure has told you that uh, he and I belong to a mission called Worldwide Evangelization for Christ, WEC International. Now, IMM is part of WEC International. Internationally, we have roughly 2,000 members. Uh, in our membership, I'm not sure exactly, but there are probably, well, there are, there's more, there are 500 plus Koreans. We have Chinese. We have something like 80 from Northeast India. Uh, we, we're an international <coughs> mission organization. And uh, we're looking to have some Africans. We're looking to have some more from Romania and uh, all sorts of places that we don't normally recruit missionaries from. South America. Uh, Latin America, we have them. So when an organization this big comes together, it has what we call guiding principles. And we have what we call in our, in our organization, uh, a motto. I don't know if you can see this one or not. Can you read that? Maybe not. It's got a reflection on it. But that's our WEC motto. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. And so I have this one. It's hanging on the wall somewhere in our house. But... That was written by C.T. Studd, the founder of our mission. And along with that motto, we have four guiding principles. And the four guiding principles are things like faith, holiness, sacrifice, and fellowship. 
Now, when you have 2,000 people collectively working together in smaller little groups, uh, those four things are very, very important. Living by faith. Uh, as a principle, we don't ask for funding. We trust the Lord to provide. And you look in the scriptures and you'll find people like Moses and Abraham, Joseph. There's an endless number. And you go to the book of Hebrews and you'll see that list expanded. Men and women who lived by faith. They practiced their faith. And this is spirituality in the raw. There's a lot of talking. There's a lot of uh, nebulous nothingness. But faith is practical. Faith is a demonstration of what we dare to believe God can do. And uh, God delights in our faith. And so that's one of our principles. Faith, holiness, and holiness is, is a huge draw card uh, because the community and the world around us is by and large not wonderfully holy. And holiness is, it involves many, many things. I did a study a few years ago on the word integrity. If you understand integrity, there's, there's a lot of biblical references to integrity. Integrity means honesty in living, honesty in business practice, honesty in relationships. And uh, this whole integrity thing intertwines with holiness. And it, it's many, many things. It's the way we live in front of other people. It's the way we demonstrate Jesus. And when you look through the Old Testament, uh, Isaiah 35, it talks about a highway. And the name of that highway is, it will be called the way of holiness, the highway of holiness. And then it says, unrighteous people won't be on it. Only holy minded people, holy practicing people, We'll be able to walk on that road. In Isaiah chapter 6, you know it. Uh, Paul is there and he has this encounter and there's all these angels and the, what they're saying in the presence of God is holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord God Almighty. Holiness is a very powerful uh, lifestyle and it's a challenge to the community around us uh, to be holy uh, and be able to say to people, we are like this because we relate to Jesus. And Jesus was holy and he lives in us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we should be holy. So we've got faith, we've got holiness, and then we've got sacrifice. Now, Right through the scriptures, and you look in uh, Hebrews 11, uh, you'll see some of that revealed again. But you've got Abraham and his willingness to sacrifice his son. Wow, sacrifice. You've got Jesus going to the cross. Not my will, but yours. I'll do it for you. Sacrifice. And as a mission, uh, we practice that. And uh, it's a demonstration of God equipping and motivating and demonstrating uh, what can be done. And when you do it for Jesus, it's not, it's not, and I, I can't say it's not sacrifice, it is, but it's not an agonizing experience. We do it because. We want to do it. We do it because we're glad to do it. We do it for Jesus. And the moment we're on that wavelength, it's no, it's no great drama. So sacrifice. Sometimes it means we don't have privacy in our home. Sometimes 
it means that we come under somebody else's authority. Sometimes it means that uh, we don't get married. I don't know. There's all sorts of possibilities. For my for my wife's family, uh, her parents were missionaries in the Congo. And because of the Second World War, her parents didn't come home from the Congo for 13 years. And in that period of time, the older children were in a boarding school. And so those children didn't see their parents and the parents didn't see those children for years, seven years. That's a sacrifice, but they did it willingly and they did it for Jesus. They did it for the people of Congo. So sacrifice is another one of our pillars. And then the last one is fellowship. And fellowship involves being able to work together with the people around us. And when you have 500 Koreans and maybe, I don't know, 100 or more Chinese and uh, all these from North India and wherever else, and Europeans. Europeans, within all our cultures, there are some great differences. And it's not just linguistic. It's not just what we eat. It's not just what we, how we dress. Fellowship has to be motivated and strengthened through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In Psalm 133, great psalm. And it says something like this, how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. That's fellowship, unity. And then the scripture says it's like the oil on Aaron's beard. And it drips down to the hem of his garment. But I tell you what, that, uh, that oil, now Aaron was a priest. He was the high priest for a, a period. But that anointing oil, it doesn't just dribble down slowly. They poured it on. And it didn't stop at the hem of his garment. It went down and dripped onto the, onto the ground. But this ability to live together in harmony is a very powerful influence. And when you've got all these different cultures and different ways of thinking, only the Spirit of God can bring a level of fellowship that is so blessed and so well anointed so in my notes i've given you some sort of reference reference points there and i've given you more verses but spirituality is many things and i've tried to gather them all together and make them as biblically sound as i can possibly do and uh, for us in our organization, faith, holiness, sacrifice, and fellowship are the things that have held our organization together for more than 100 years. And uh, they will continue to do so because they're biblically based. So for yourselves, I have no idea what your future will be. Uh, You'll go back to your home countries. Uh, hopefully, at some point, COVID will have burned out and you'll be able to go back to where you come from. But my prayer for you all is that when you... ...be everything that Jesus has prepared and is preparing you to be. Amen. Amen. Thank you.